Hi everyone and welcome to our first iLand Water Solutions webinar where we'll be looking at the importance of water filtration systems in modern human society. My name's Darren and I'm the Queensland sales rep at iLand. If you're based in Queensland, please feel welcome to give me a call or email or come visit me at the office which is on the north side of Brisbane in Albany Creek. We also have a display centre at our Sydney office at Unit 24 The Hub, 128 Station Road, Seven Hills. Don't worry if you didn't catch that, you'll find all of our contact details on our website at www.islandwater.com.au Today I'll be discussing the important role that access to water has played in the formation of ancient societies and its continuing influence on us today. Then we'll look at the contamination issues currently faced in the world which surprisingly have also impacted our water supplies here in Australia more than we might expect. We'll look at the water treatment process and how it deals with these contamination issues. We'll talk about the problems with bottled water and distilled water. And finally, we'll look at what Island Water is about and a brief look at some Island Water products that can help make tap water a bit safer and taste a whole lot better. So water and human society. The rule of three says we can live three weeks without food, three days without water and three minutes without air. Ancient human civilizations that thrived all had one thing in common, access to a dependable water supply. One of our first major civilizations, the ancient region of Mesopotamia in the Middle East, now modern Iraq and parts of Syria, Kuwait and Turkey, sprang up between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. Evidence of extensive and complex irrigation systems still stand today, such as this system located in Mardin in Turkey. The ancient Egyptian civilization centered around the annual flooding of the Nile and still does to this day. It is in fact celebrated by Egyptians as an annual holiday for two weeks starting August 15th. And of course, more recently, one of the structures the Romans were famous for was their magnificent aqueducts, which still stand in various places today. This one's outside the city of Caesarea in Israel. The city itself was originally built by King Herod around 25 BC. None of these civilizations could have existed without ready access to water, which was used for drinking, watering crops and livestock, and also for sanitization. But there was also a downside. Basing a civilization around a water source also meant waterborne pathogens could take hold in whole populations, and as the populations grew, so did the sanitization issues. Of course, as we know very well now, using the same water for your sanitization as well as for drinking and washing doesn't come without certain problems. Even today, an estimated 1.5 million annual deaths around the globe are attributed to waterborne diseases caused by protozoan, bacterial, viral and algal contaminations. We call these microbial or biological contaminants. The term contaminant can also mean any physical, chemical or radiological substance or matter in water. Pictured here is Giardia, which is a fairly common waterborne parasite, and Australia has had its fair share of problems with it as well. In 1998, in an event known as the Sydney Water Crisis, Giardia and Cryptosporidium were detected in the Sydney water supply, leading to several boil water alerts. This was later played down after no health problems which might be attributed to tainted water were recorded, but it did lead to the reorganisation of water supply and water management functions and agencies in greater metropolitan Sydney. A major biological water contamination issue regularly faced around Australia is as a result of bushfires and extreme weather events such as droughts and floods. The scale of Australia's 2019-2020 bushfire season is astonishing when compared to other major bushfire events in recent history. Some 18 million hectares were destroyed, which was more than six times more than the 2019 Siberian wildfires next in the list. The financial cost of rebuilding homes and infrastructure would be estimated to top $2 billion dollars, not to mention the health costs, including a decline in air quality, which in this case had even affected other continents, including Antarctica. But it also has a surprising and massive impact on our water supplies. Even before we get into bushfires, droughts alone cause major problems for water supplies, not just in water running out, but in water running low. As water in dams runs low and evaporates, salinization of the water and the growth of toxic algae become problems. Bushfires then add a further complication into the mix as large quantities of ash and phosphorus are deposited into catchment areas, which becomes wonderful fertilizer for algae in dams once the rains and inevitable floods come. In February 2020, water authorities were forced to disconnect Warragamba Dam, which supplies drinking water to Greater Sydney, for several days due to bushfire-related contamination. This adds an enormous cost to our economy as well. Sydney has spent an estimated $2 billion and Melbourne $5.7 billion on desalination plants to cope with water affected by droughts followed by flooding and other extreme weather events. 
In 2003, Canberra was forced to construct a membrane bioreactor treatment plant at a cost of $40 million to combat contamination caused by bushfires in the Brindabella Mountains, followed by heavy rain washing contaminants into the Cotter catchment area, which is largely in New South Wales, so these issues can even cross state lines. Water treatment facilities tend to deal with algae and other pathogen outbreaks caused by droughts followed by floods by dumping more chlorine into the water, which is a bit of a problem in itself, making it taste like a swimming pool in some cases and leaving hair and skin after a shower feeling dry and powdery. Physical contaminants are sediment or organic material suspended in the water, which tend to increase markedly as our dams run low during drought conditions and we start sucking up mud. This is a huge pain and another added cost for our water treatment plants to deal with tons of extra mud and silt in the water, which can slow down and clog equipment. We've probably all experienced brown coloured water from our taps at some point, but in some cases it gets so bad that it makes the news. In February 2020, residents of the town of Lithgow in New South Wales described their tap water as having the appearance of Coca-Cola. Lithgow City Council said that the appearance was caused by a mixture of iron and manganese sediment and stated that while it didn't look pleasant, it didn't pose any health risks. Oh well, top me up then. Similar issues were reported on the Queensland Gold Coast around the same time. Chemical contaminants can be man-made or natural. These can be anything from heavy metals like arsenic, cadmium, chromium, lead and selenium to nitrogen, bleach, salts, pesticides and toxins produced by bacteria. Another side effect of the drought conditions in Australia is the silt in dams being disturbed, which in some cases contains arsenic and other heavy metals from our mining past. Arsenic, pictured here in powdered form, is a byproduct of the smelting process to extract gold, copper and lead from ore, but it can also occur in some water sources naturally. The World Health Organization recommends a guideline of no more than 10 micrograms per litre in water, so some exposure is considered relatively safe. However, water contaminated with arsenic above safe levels is still a health concern for 137 million people in more than 70 countries around the world, who in many cases have little choices about drinking it, even knowing that it is contaminated. Arsenic poisoning is usually a slow process which can cause various types of cancer and gastrointestinal issues. Australia has occasional problems with it as well. In December 2019, the Urala Shire Council warned residents not to drink the town's water after arsenic levels four times higher than the recommended guideline were detected. Another recent example of heavy metal contamination in water supplies in Australia also happened in December 2019. It was reported by ABC News that samples taken from Sydney's Cataract and Cordeaux dams had exceeded acceptable levels of iron more than 90 times over the last three years. The iron contamination was described as a shocking metallic sludge and was a result of dissolved metallic elements produced by coal mining making their way into the dam's catchment areas, in combination with the dam's capacities being below 30% due to drought conditions. Unusually high levels of aluminium were also found in both dams, with scientists proposing that a deeper examination of the sludge was likely to also expose levels of manganese, lithium, strontium, barium, titanium, zinc and nickel, which are commonly found along with iron. PFAS. In October 2017, ABC's Four Corners ran a story on contaminated ground and surface water found in multiple Australian communities, including Oakey, Williamstown and Catherine. The source of the contamination was found to be chemical compounds collectively known as perfluoroalkyl acids, more commonly known and much easier to pronounce as PFAS. PFAS have been used in firefighting foams around the world since the 1970s. The affected Australian communities in most cases had military bases nearby where firefighting foams were used extensively both in fighting actual fires and in training exercises, in some cases on a daily basis. The Australian government allegedly knew about the dangers of PFAS as early as 1987 but continued using it until a phase out began only recently in 2016. PFAS have been used extensively in other products as well and have now affected the water, soil and food chain all around the world. So much so that trace amounts, which are considered to pose minimal risk, can now be found in most people. PFAS unfortunately have a cumulative effect in the body and take four to five years to break down. Continually adding more by consuming contaminated water or food elevates PFAS to dangerous, possibly carcinogenic levels that are linked with testicular, prostate and kidney cancer. PFAS have also been linked to thyroid disease and elevated cholesterol, leading to increased cardiovascular disease risk. Tests on children show it may also affect the immune system. 
Volatile organic compounds or VOCs are chemical compounds which can also contaminate water. They can be man-made or naturally occurring and are characterized by having a high vapor pressure at room temperature so they're easily transported by air to settle on lakes or streams or they can bubble up from underground. Most scents and odors are due to VOCs which usually makes VOC contaminated water a bit on the nose and therefore fairly easy to detect. Common VOCs include fossil fuels, formaldehyde, chlorofluorocarbons, benzene, acetone and methylene chloride. Our city's smog generally contains lots of VOCs as well as some heavy metals which ends up in our catchment areas and groundwater. In March 2006, the Sydney Morning Herald reported that smog levels in Sydney were 10 times worse than other Australian cities according to the annual report of the National Environment Protection Council. Other cities didn't escape unscathed in the report either, with Melbourne, Brisbane, Perth and Newcastle exceeding the national standards on several occasions. Another big chemical contaminant we need to consider is both prescribed and illicit drugs for both humans and animals. All of these end up passed into our wastewater which can end up in our groundwater to eventually end up back at our taps. Current water treatment processes may not necessarily remove it. Microplastics. I'm not sure whether to class this as a physical contaminant or chemical, perhaps it's a bit of both. According to a report in the Sydney Morning Herald in August 2019, we ingest on average around 5 grams of plastic every week in our drinking water, which is about the same size as a credit card. While the effects aren't yet well known and would appear to pass from our systems without causing harm, there are suggestions it may damage immune systems, cause inflammation or perhaps carry toxins such as heavy metals or pesticides. The final contaminant we should mention is radiological contaminants. Water can become radioactive from natural sources or due to human error or waste. The yellow points in this image indicate known radioactive water sources, most of which are caused by uranium. You can look this map up for more detail at water.australianmap.net. These sites are considered above the level of radiation regarded as safe for human consumption, but there is a level where it is considered safe. Bananas, for example, contain potassium, which gives off radiation as it decays, but our bodies contain more potassium than bananas do anyway, so effectively we're already more radioactive than bananas are to begin with. Once radioactivity reaches unsafe levels though, it is impossible to detect without scientific equipment, so I'd definitely caution against drinking from streams and billabongs anywhere near old or new mining sites in Australia, particularly in the Northern Territory or old nuclear test sites for that matter, for example Maralinga and Emu Field in South Australia. Thankfully we've learned a bit about the dangers of radiation since products like this were openly advertised and sold. It was also added to other products including toothpaste and beauty products. I assume to add that radiant glow in the dark. Okay then. Fracking sites in the Kimberley and Western Australia in June 2018 also reportedly uncovered several sources of groundwater contaminated by a relatively high concentration of radium-228. While above the guidelines for human consumption, a spokesman for the mining company claimed that the water could be diluted with bore water and fed to beef cattle or safely injected back underground. I guess you're not going to be worried about your steak glowing in the dark in the middle of an earthquake. As of January 2020, cleanup of the Fukushima nuclear power plant disaster has led to approximately 1.2 million tonnes of contaminated water currently being held in storage tanks. Japanese scientists are pushing to release this water into the ocean after removing all radioactive particles from it except for tritium, an isotope of hydrogen also known as hydrogen-3 which is hard to separate but considered to be relatively harmless. They claim this is a common practice to nuclear power stations all around the world. So what do our governments do to keep our water safe? This diagram shows the general water treatment process. Water is first gathered in a lake or reservoir, it's then extracted and larger items such as branches, leaves and twigs are removed, then coagulants and hydroxides like lime and alum are added and mixed in a process called flocculation which causes the smaller particles to bond together to form larger ones which are easier to remove. Then it goes to a sedimentation tank where heavier contaminants settle to the bottom and the lighter ones settle as scum on top. The cleaner water is then extracted and sent through a filtration process to remove any remaining physical contaminants before being treated with a disinfectant, namely chlorine. It's then pumped to a storage tank for delivery to homes and businesses. The storage tanks are normally placed at the highest points possible in order to provide water pressure to the households below. I'll include a link in the description below to a short video from Sydney Water showing the whole water treatment process. 
While not all water treatment services in Australia add fluoride, the vast majority do, and it comes with some controversy. The effect of fluoride on tooth enamel to prevent cavities is well known, but adding fluoride to a public water supply is regarded by many as an extremely crude fluoride delivery system. The fluoride needs to be applied to the surface of the tooth for it to do any good, and while drinking fluoridated water works because the water has to enter the body via the mouth, and there is some benefit in having trace amounts of fluoride in saliva, for the most part, once it's in our stomach, it's no longer doing much for our teeth. Drinking fluoridated water may also have become completely unnecessary and even overkill in developed countries with ready access to modern dental care practices and fluoridated toothpaste. There's also a question of unregulated dosage. Not only will dosage vary depending on the amount of water consumed per individual, we also take in varying additional quantities of fluoride from other sources such as our toothpaste, pharmaceuticals and food and drinks produced with fluoridated water. The recommended daily fluoride dosage is 4 mg for men and 3 mg for women. At the recommended 8 glasses of water per day with an average 1 mg per litre in fluoridated town water, we're already at 2 mg, which is half the male recommended daily dose and more than half for women. And that's before we've even brushed our teeth, which can potentially add up to 2 mg each time, putting us slightly over the recommended daily dosage. A small overexposure to fluoride is relatively harmless though. It can cause tiny stains on teeth, but those are really only visible to dentists under the right light and microscope. But at more extreme levels, it has been linked with heavy brown staining, and more seriously, IQ deficits in children, brain defects in developing fetuses, and can aggravate the effects of iodine deficiency, which is essential for thyroid function. So there is some merit in monitoring your dosage. Using chlorine as a disinfectant to kill off biological contaminants is a cheap and effective solution, but it does have its drawbacks. It doesn't taste great for starters, and it can make skin feel dry and itchy, irritate eyes, and make hair feel like straw. Blonde people can even develop green-tinged hair from overexposure to chlorine. Another downside is that along with killing pathogens, it can also kill off gut flora, something we're just beginning to understand the importance of in areas such as obesity, uh, gastrointestinal infections, and other conditions. This may possibly go beyond just drinking chlorinated water too. Some people assert that showering and flushing toilets can volatilize chlorine, releasing it into the air we breathe in our homes. So what else can we do to make our drinking water safer and more palatable? One solution is to drink bottled water. The first problem with buying bottled water is the cost. A quick look at Coles Online turns up bottled water from around 50 cents per litre, right up to a whopping $9.44 per litre. If we compare that to the cost of running a home water purifier, even factoring in the original RRP purchase price, plus the cost of replacing cartridges at the recommended intervals, we come to a figure of just over four cents per litre over a five year period. That's just 67 cents per day for all of the water needed for drinking and cooking for a family of four. Is bottled water better quality? The answer to that is no, not really. It's actually a bit of a scam. The bottled water industry is worth hundreds of millions of dollars, thanks largely to some very slick marketing tactics, leading people to believe that bottled water is more pure than tap water. But the reality in many cases is the opposite, or the water is no better or worse than tap water, and in some cases it actually is tap water. Tap water is subjected to much higher standards, which are strictly monitored by water authorities 24 hours a day, seven days per week. Bottled water, on the other hand, falls under the authority of Food Standards Australia and New Zealand and is enforced by state and territory level food authorities. Some bottled water producers are also voluntary members of the Australasian Bottled Water Institute, the ABWI, which sets standards for bottling and requires testing once per year. Let me say that again, once per year, and that's only by the companies who voluntarily belong to the ABWI. What that means for the large part is someone would actually have to prove the product had a problem and report it before any action is taken. Blind taste tests reveal that the vast majority of people can't tell the difference between bottled water and tap water anyway. And worse still, the sources of the bottled water in many cases are shrouded in mystery. Producers usually refuse to reveal where exactly it comes from. Random tests on some products have revealed microorganisms and microplastics, claimed mineral contents actually being lower than tap water, and contents being vastly different to labels, which has led to some companies becoming the targets of class action lawsuits as a result. But there is an even bigger problem, and that problem is plastic waste. Anyone who's ever participated in a Clean Up Australia Day knows just how much rubbish bottled water products have added to our environment. 
The discarded bottles float so they end up washed into stormwater drains to finish up in our rivers, creeks and eventually our oceans, not to mention the amount of landfill taken up by them when they don't float away. The bottles eventually break down into microplastics and end up in our groundwater and catchment areas amongst other things. Scientists have termed our era the plastic age rather than the bronze age or iron age and will have our own geological layer visible as a pale pink, blue and white line. When you're out and about, grabbing a bottle from a shop can be cool and refreshing, but if you're going to do that, try to buy the products that come in glass bottles. You'll pay more, but you're mostly paying for the glass. That way you can refill them from your home water purifier and store them in the fridge to take with you next time. Plastic bottles can be reused a couple of times, but they're often made of cheap, inferior quality plastic, which can start to break down and release toxic BPAs into the water. Perhaps distilled water is the ultimate solution. Distilling is a process of boiling water, collecting the steam and condensing it back into water. It's as close to pure as water is likely to get, which makes it perfect for use in steam irons and lead acid car batteries, where you don't really want mineral content causing corrosion or chemical reactions, but this level of purity has several downsides when it comes to drinking it. The first is that it tastes kind of lifeless and flat to many people, which is due to the mineral content being removed. Minerals like magnesium and calcium are essential for our survival, and if we don't take it in from our water, our bodies have to get it from somewhere else. While some people recommend drinking distilled water as part of a detox, drinking it for too long may lead to becoming mineral or electrolyte depleted, which can have various serious consequences, even to the point of death if we're not getting those minerals and electrolytes from our diet or other sources. Fasting while drinking only distilled water is definitely not recommended. A home water purifier is the simplest and most cost effective solution. Island Water Solutions was formed in 2018 to fulfill what we believe is a strong, if not essential need in the world today for quality water, particularly for drinking. We believe the superior quality and benefits of our water purifiers will be appreciated by our customers both now and in the future as we continue to source and help develop new and beneficial products. We believe that water purification technology and systems are a major part of our modern society and will continue to be in the years to come. Island Water Solutions Proprietary Limited with our website at www.islandwater.com.au was created to be on the front line of water purification technology. We are passionate about clean water and committed to finding and providing the best possible solutions to fulfill our customers' requirements and expectations in water-related solutions. We have a range of water purification products available, including single and three-stage filter systems, reverse osmosis systems, and shower dechlorinators, which you can also check out at our Sydney Display Centre, and I have a few up here in Brisbane as well. One of the first products we made available was the Ezac Easy Aqua 250B Benchtop Water Purifier. This is a simple to install three-stage system. In the first stage, tap water goes through a polypropylene or PP filter to remove any larger particles like dirt and rust. Then the water is passed through a coconut shell granular activated carbon filter to remove chemicals like chlorine, as well as heavy metals and any VOCs, which as I mentioned earlier are usually the culprits behind any unpleasant odours. The final stage is an EM medium filter to remove microorganisms like bacteria, viruses and cysts. A cyst in this case refers to the microscopic eggs or larva of parasites, not a fluid filled sac. EM medium is a NASA technology for the reuse of water in space programs. Ezex EM Medium is characterised by having up to 99.9999% BRE or bacterial removal efficiency while still maintaining a high flow rate, so you're not standing around for 10 minutes waiting for a glass to fill up. Most other products on the market tend to only promise 99.99%, which may not sound like much of a difference, but at a microscopic level, it's the difference between the ability to remove up to 10,000 nasties versus 1 million in a given quantity of water. It's also available in an under sink version called the Easy Aqua 250BU. These are a little more difficult to install and involve drilling a 12mm hole in your sink, but it keeps everything out of sight with only the filtered water faucet or tap visible above. Reverse osmosis systems represent the ultimate in home water purifiers. The Clean Pure RO2000 system is a pump powered five stage under sink system with a massive 14.3 litre external holding tank, so you're never waiting around for filtered water at the tap. The five stages are a PP filter at the first level, then the water passes through not one, but two granular activated carbon filters before being passed through the reverse osmosis membrane, which is a very fine grade of filter which will remove almost all dissolved solids to provide the most pure water a system can give. The final stage is a post-carbon filter which picks up anything that might have been missed and adds a crisper taste. 
Elias ROC 188 and 189 compact RO systems are similar five stage systems but in this case the tank is a little smaller at 8.3 litres and contained within the case of the unit. The ROC 189 has a powered pump and warning lights for any detected problems such as leaks or a high TDS value. TDS stands for Total Dissolved Solids and a notification when a filter change is due. The ROC 188 model is almost exactly the same, but it doesn't have a pump and therefore doesn't require power to operate. Filter cartridges tend to last a fair while as well. Manufacturers may vary a little, but the table here is a general guideline based on a family of four and the average person requiring around four litres per day. Obviously, smaller families would need to replace filters less frequently, while larger families would need to do that more frequently. More frequent replacement may also be required if you notice reduced water pressure or no water flow, if the water becomes discoloured or you can see particles in it or if the taste has deteriorated. Failure to replace filter cartridges at the recommended intervals may result in bacteria growth affecting water quality and can damage a powered water filter system if the pump gets overloaded trying to push water through blocked filters. Another indicator if you're using a TDS meter to regularly check your water quality and you notice the reading has increased. That one would normally be the RO membrane due for replacement. If a full size system isn't feasible, Alia's activated carbon filter jug may be just what you need. It's designed to fit into fridge doors and has a unique spout to prevent dust or anything else getting in. Cartridges are very easy to replace and last around two months. If you find chlorine leaves you with dry skin and hair when you shower, Alias Shower Made Dechlorinating Shower Filter could be your solution. It features an ergonomic design for handheld showers with a handy data indicator to let you know when a filter is due. I have overview and basic installation guides for the Ezek and Alia products on our YouTube channel. Please check them out and give the subscribe button a click if you're not already a subscriber. We'll be adding more products as well as other interesting water related videos from time to time. So give the bell a click there too to receive a notification of new videos as they go up. For more information about Island Water products, please visit our website at www.islandwater.com.au. The blog articles there have more detail about the topics discussed today, plus more. If you'd like more information or if you're interested in becoming an Island Water reseller or would just like a price list, please send an email to sales at islandwater.com.au. Check us out on social media as well. You can find us on Facebook, YouTube and Twitter under Island Water. That's Island with a hyphen. Thanks and bye for now.